دستورنا القرآن وديننا الإسلام أركانه الجليلة دعائم الفديلة ويا الشهادتان كعيدة الإيمان وصوم والصلاة وحج والزكاة Our guide is the Quran, our religion is Islam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillahi alladhi hadana li hadha wa ma kunna li nahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. Alhamdulillahi ala ni'mati al-Islami wa kafa biha ni'ma. Alhamdulillahi ala minnati al-wilayati wa kafa biha minna. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah. وأشهد أن سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا النبي المؤيد والرسول المسدد والمصطفى الأمجد والمحمود الأحمد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين سفن النجاة الأعلام من ركب سفينتهم نجا ومن تخلف عنها Halika wa gharik. Thumma amma ba'd, respected elders, brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Right from the outset for tonight's lecture, I want to share something with you. In order to further drive the concept of a clean heart and a tranquil heart and a visionary heart. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he gives us a conscious... He gives us that conscious and that vision. You know that, unfortunately, in English, there is no good word for that word in Arabic. No good translation. Unless I stand to be corrected. Have you heard of the word basira? Basira. Right? A mu'min does not see with his eyes. He sees with his basira. If he wants to identify the truth, it is not by eyes. Quran confirms that. He says, they see the signs of Allah with their eyes, but their hearts deny it. Sometimes you see the truth in front of you, but you cannot acknowledge it. You cannot acknowledge it. Why? Because your basira, your heart, your vision, your insight, let me say it this way, the eyes of your heart are blind. إِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارِ وَإِنَّمَا تَعْمَلْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the real blindness are not the blindness of the eyes. The real blindness is the blindness of the hearts within the breast or the chest of a human being. Look at this story. You know Jalaluddin al-Rumi, huh? the famous uh, mystic or poet or whatever you want to call him. His teacher, brothers and sisters, by the name of of Shams at Tabrizi, that was his teacher. Very, يعني, he's a sage, you can call it. Very great scholar of his time. So a person came one day and he wanted to create problems between Jalaluddin al Rumi and his teacher Shams at Tabrizi. So he said to him, he said, Oh Jalaluddin. Today, I saw your teacher drinking alcohol. Drinking alcohol. What did uh, Jalaluddin al-Rumi reply? He said, by Allah, if I saw him with his dress drenched in alcohol, and the smell and the essence of alcohol is coming out of his dress, I would say someone had poured alcohol on him, not he drank it. Then he said, and by Allah, if I saw him on top of a mountain saying, Ana rabbukumul a'la, I would say he's reading the ayah from the Quran. You know the ayah of Fir'aun, Qala ana rabbukumul a'la. Then look what he said. He says, oh son of Adam, you know to that man, go away from me. For I know my teacher, this is the point, not by my eyes, but my, by my heart. This is the vision, the heart that needs to identify people. If you know someone, if you know your community, if you know the persons you are dealing with, don't doubt them. We were talking about the doubtful heart yesterday, right? And we didn't finish because I didn't have time 
because of the time constraints, right? So don't take lies, fabrication, especially when it comes to people who try to create friction among people. People who spread rumors among people or say things that are unfitting, you know? Things that are unfitting, firstly, in terms of the hukuk of brotherhood. In terms of the hukuk of brotherhood. Why I say that? Because, you know, some people think that we have about maybe some hukuk over one another that amount to maybe 10 hukuk, 12 hukuk, 13 hukuk. When the imam was asked, what is the right of a brother over a brother or a sister over a sister? He said, there are 40 rights. 40 rights from a brother over a brother. Which of these rights do we practice? You know, where? Which of these rights do we practice in terms of support, in terms of defense of one's security, uh, 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 dignity, in terms of protection of one's honor, in all these things, you know? Instead, what we do, we create more issues and problems for one another instead of reconciling our matters. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa just like this guy who wanted to pro create problems between, you know, Jalal al-Din al-Rumi and his... Rasulullah says this. These people learned from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He says, the one who always tries to reconcile between two fighting parties or a person who manages to reconcile between two fighting parties or opposing parties that have some issues with one another. In the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that action of reconciling differences is better than all prayers and all fasts that are voluntary. Any voluntary fast and any voluntary prayer will not come to the amount of fixing problems between brothers. Why? Because we are talking about communities. We are talking about societies. If members of the same society clash, then the whole community collapses. And we cannot afford to have a community that is dysfunctional, right? We cannot have a community that is dysfunctional. And why pride ourselves on just slander and gossip? Look at this hadith. I'm sure you've all read it one day in your life. I'm sure. This hadith comes in the form of a dua. And what is this dua? You know, there is no school on the face of this earth. And I'll challenge anyone to bring me a school that is so rich in dua like the school of Ahlul Bayt. Salawat <laughs> alayhi wa I'll stand to be corrected. You know, one of the main causes that I was drawn to the school of Ahlul Bayt, salamullah alayhim ajma'in, from my previous school was the school of dua. And my first remark was, when I read, this is the place I want to read from. My first book of dua that I ever had and was given to me before the switch was what? Dua Sahifa Sajjadi. Allahu Akbar. You know, there is a brother in America. Inshallah, he's hearing me. His name is On Ali Khalfan. Tahrik Tarsil al Quran. Huh? Right? He's from here, I know. He's probably the first coach to go to America. But look at this visionary man. He went to America not for his pocket. He went to America to spread the name of Allah. And Allah gave him. Deal with Allah and feel the difference. Deal with Allah and feel that. What did he do? I don't know how many copies, millions of the copies of the Quran he's given out. One day we were sitting at night, you know, having some positive baraza, which is good. Alhamdulillah, yesterday our leadership were recognizing how important it is to have positive baraza. I'm not against baraza, by the way. I can't be against baraza and go and sit in baraza. Right? But baraza that is constructive, baraza that can brainstorm and as a result give us the best solution into the future. Right? A baraza where ideas can come out from so that we can take the community a step further for the benefit of the community, right? We were sitting at night, one Ramadan, and we were talking about, he had an idea, uh, Onan. 
that we must get next to every copy of a Quran, a copy of Sahifa. <laughs> Sajjadiyya. So I said, uncle, you know, Wallah al -Azim, that would be the best idea ever to do. But we have to change the name. We can't call it Sahifa Sajjadiyya because it won't appeal to people. Because you know, I don't know who Imam Sajjad. So we started talking. What do you think is an ideal name? I said, the universal book of prayer. They, because it is a universal book of prayer. Anyone who holds Sahifa Sajjadiyya initially would not know it's a Muslim book. It will appeal to all the hearts and minds. Then later on at the end, put a biography about Imam Sajjad. Allahu Akbar. Huh? How beautiful that would be. Look what Imam Sajjad says in my most beloved du'as of du'as. Makarimul Akhlaq. Allahu Akbar. Dua of Makarimul Akhlaq. He says this. Subhanallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. This is how we need to utilize the month of Ramadan, Muharram, Layam al Shabaniya, you know, oh, Shaban, Ramadan, Muharram, Rajab, so that we can start changing ourselves. You know, yesterday we were talking about Muhasaba, Muraqaba, Musharata. These are the kinds of things that we need to do to ourselves. Look what he says. He says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. وَمَتِّعْنِي بِهُدًا صَالِحٍ Oh Allah, give me a righteous guidance. He's Imam. He's Ma'asum. Huh? So I can learn. You know? Give me, oh Allah, a righteous guidance. Whereby I do not switch it with anything else. I don't change that righteous guidance. لَا أَسْتَبْدُلْ بِهِ وَطَرِيقَةُ حَقٍّ لَا أَزِيغُ عَنْهَا and a path of truth that I never ever leave or stay away from. Then he goes until he says, Allahumma la tada'ana. Until he says what? See, life, brothers and sisters, is not just about living. If your life is not constructive, then khuda hafiz. Seriously, I'm telling you, khuda hafiz. Going is better than staying. Look what he says. He says, Oh Allah, فَإِن كَانَ عُمْرِي مَرْتَعًا لِلشَّيْطَانِ If my life is going to be a playground for Satan, huh? then take my life away. Allahu Akbar. فَاقْبُضْنِي إِلَيْكَ قَبْلَ أَنْ يَسْبِقَ مَكْتُكَ إِلَيْهِ Before your wrath befalls me. You know, I don't want your wrath to befall me on account of allowing my life to be what? The devil's playground. And then he says, أو يستحكم غضبك علي Or that your anger is so fixed that there is no turning back. Then he says, اللهم صلي على محمد This is the point here. This is community what? Community relationships. Forging the best of akhlaq among us as communities. He says, Oh Allah, وأبدلني وَأَبْدِلْنِي بِغْضَةِ أَهْلِ الشَّنَاءِ بِبُغْضَةِ أَهْلِ الشَّنَاءَانِ الْمَحَبَّةِ He said, oh Allah, if there is a group of people that they don't like me, right? Then change my feeling towards them with love. Allahu Akbar. Don't allow me to hate them. No, 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 no. If people hate me, allow me, ya Allah, to encompass them, to change them. To make them aware that hatred is of no good to the community and to the person himself. And then he goes on to say, وَمَنْ حَسَدِ أَهْلِ الْبَغْيِ الْمَوَدَّةِ And the ones who have envy towards me, Ya Allah, I pray to you, change them so they would have what? They would have love towards me. And then he says, وَمِنْ ظِنَّةِ أَهْلِ الصَّلَاحِ الثِّقَةِ Also, Ya Allah, if people think good of me, advance it. Huh? If people think good of me, Ya Allah, please don't let me fail them. Let me keep that trustworthiness. Right? And we must employ trustworthiness among us. You know what saddens me the most among us Shias? Is that we don't trust anyone. We don't trust one another when it comes to salah. He says, no, no, no. I won't pray behind him. Why? He's not your brother in Islam. You don't trust him. He's a muwali of Ali ibn Abi Talib. 
Someone came to Imam al-Sadiq and says, I'm poor. He said, no, you're not poor. You are the richest man on earth. He said, how? I'm telling you, I'm penniless. <laughs> I don't have a, a single cent in my, I have, uh, you know, mint lollies. La hawla wa I have mint lollies, you know. May Allah bless Anwar Ali Malikia. So he says, I don't have money. How come you're telling me that, you know, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alihi, you are He said, tell me something. If someone now came and pay you a hundred thousand dirham or pay you the world worth in gold and told you abandon the, the wilaya of Ali ibn Abi Talib the man says over my dead body he said see you are the richest man in the world <laughs> Allahu Akbar you are the richest man in the world right because we cannot trust one another no look, he has to have a Mawlana but God help you if you want to trust just Mawlanas you know <laughs> I'm telling you I'm talking about myself Huh? It's just the amama. I'll tell you something. When I went to Hausa, one of the students who was in Hausa, he said, "Ah, why are you coming here so that you can hide behind the amama?" I said, "Thank you for your good thoughts. Thank you for your uh, anticipated, you know, husnul dhan in me." I said, "Thank you for your anticipated husnul dhan." I said, "No, that's not my purpose. I'll tell you what my purpose is." I said, the day I know I'm going to hide behind my amama so I can hide my mistakes, I'll burn it. But I came here so that I can add beauty to the amama through my akhlaq. If I can't find this kind of people, then we are in trouble, brothers and sisters. We are in serious, serious trouble. We must have husnul dhan with one another. We must have husnul dhan with one another. That what forges what? Forges better relationship and more consolidated community among ourselves. Then he says, the Imam Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi ba'da salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And grant me from the animosity and enmity of people towards me allegiance. But these words that the Imam uses. Yani when the Imam says, Oh Allah, grant me the ability that those who have animosity and enmity towards me, that one day they will give me their allegiance based on what you tell me. How can you get the allegiance of someone that hates you through your action? Imam al-Rida sallallahu alayhi wa says, Kunu lana du'atan samiteen. Call to our cause through your silence. Qalu, kayfa naku, kayfa nad'u ilaykum ya ibn Rasulillah. He says, how can we call to your way silently? He says, you learn our teachings, then you put them into action. Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi says what? He says, ta'allamu ulumana, thumma allimuha linnas. Learn our affairs, learn our teachings. And then teach it to others through your action. For by Allah, this is qasam. By Allah means what? Qasam. Imam is saying, by Allah, if people came to know and are aware after there are enemies, right? What we said, there are enemies. If they become aware and enlightened about our teaching, they will have no choice but to follow us. ما وسعهم إلا أن يتبعونا because they have no choice to be otherwise you know they won't have a cause to hate you or to have enmity towards you because they look at your action and say why in God's name am I hating this person I was relating a story I don't know maybe in Tabligh I said there was a man who was a childhood friend of Abu Jahl Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam goes past Abu Jahl and this childhood friend and he's talking to them. So Abu Jahl says to that childhood friend, at one stage, by the way, this is very important for our youth. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Five past nine already? Allahu Akbar. 20 minutes I've been talking. <laughs> okay. It's good when you're having fun. Friendship has a major impact on your outcome. That man, who's the friend of Abu Jahl, the riwayat says at one stage he had an appointment with Rasulullah 
to come and confess that he will become a Muslim. Just before he came to Rasulullah, Abu Jahl rocked at his place. Rocked up at his place. He said, where are you going? He said, I have a meeting with Muhammad. He said, you're not going. He said, why? He said, I know what he's going to do to you. You're going there to become a Muslim, aren't you? He said, I'm going to talk to him. He said, don't go. He died a kafir. He wouldn't believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Why? The circle of friends. There is a hadith that says, tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. Huh? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says what? Al-mar'u ala deeni khalilih fal yanzur ahadukum man yukhalid. The religion of one of you is according to the friend he keeps. So make sure you keep good friends. Subhanallah. Anyway, so this man was standing with Abu Jahl. Rasulullah passes by. He said, he comes the liar. Ma'adiratan ya Rasulullah. With all utmost respect to your person, ya Rasulullah. He says, he comes the liar. So Rasulullah respectfully walks away. Now, this man relates the story to us later. He says, there was no one but me and Abu Jahl. <laughs> so I asked Abu Jahl, I said, Bana, serious Bana now, in their language, you know? He says, Bana, seriously, do you really think Muhammad is a liar? Look, there is no one, me and you. Come on, come up with the truth. You know, normally when you are alone, the truth comes out, right? Because we, there's nothing to hide. So he says, Wallati wal uzza. By the lad and the uzza. By the two idols. There is no truthful person on the face of this Quraysh like Muhammad. This is Abu Jahl. <laughs> you know? And the best testimony is the testimony that comes from who? From your enemy, from your adversary. Right? Because he has nothing to win. Actually, he will lose. To testify that you are the most truthful when he is your worst enemy. Right? Then he's a hypocrite, right? In front of others, right? He's a hypocrite in front of others. So the Imam sallallahu alayhi wa says what? He says, allow me this. So this allowance means what? Means allow me the ability to change. Inna Allah la yughayyiru ma biqawmin hatta yughayyiru ma biqawmin. Allah does not change the state of affairs of people until they take the initiative to change themselves first. Day one I said, what is our, our problem? I didn't dwell on it. I said, what is our understanding of the concept of Hidayah? When we raise our hands and we say, Allahumma hdini fi man hadayt. Oh Allah, guide me among the guided ones. Our concept of Hidayah is what? Our concept of Hidayah is contrary to that particular dua. Our understanding of Hidayah is misconstrued. Because Hidayah, according to Allah, is what? I sent you books. I sent you prophet. I sent you saints, yani imams. And I given you one of the best jewels and the best gifts that you can find out truth from falsehood called aql, called your brain, called your intellect. So you can use... The books of God, the prophets of God, the saints of God, the sages of God, the ulama that Allah sends, plus your aql to what? To choose. Inna hadaynahu sabila, imma shakiran wa imma kafura. We have given him both ways, shown him both ways. Shown him both ways through what? Through aql, anbiya, mursaleen, ulama, awsiya, all this. So you choose. So Allahumma dini fi man hadayt means what? This is what we think it is. Oh Allah, send a battalion of Malaika with four, uh, 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 AK-47. Let them put it on my head and order me to go to prayer. No, it's not going to happen. All right? There's no such thing. This is not Hidayah. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to worship Him by choice, not by force. Not by force. Nothing comes by force. Allah does not want people to turn to Him by force. By scaredness, by fright, but no. He wants you to come to him 
as a form of feeling the appeal of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life. That's how Allah wants you to relate to him, right? Of course, in the course of doing that, there are challenges. Obviously, in anything that you face, there will be challenges. You want to become a lawyer, there are challenges. You want to be a doctor, there are challenges. You want to study and go abroad, there are challenges. Nothing comes on a silver platter. Also, Iman does not come on a silver platter. Allah says, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسِ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ People think they will be left to say, we are believers, yet they will not be put to the test. It has to be corroborated. Right? So this life is a place of test, not a place of rest. It's a place of test, not a place of rest. Jibra'il came to Rasulullah and Rasulullah asked Jibra'il, do you ever laugh at something people do? He said, yes. <laughs> this is very strange hadith, yani. very lovely hadith, yani. very nice hadith. Maybe I can find it here so that I can give you the proper, the proper uh, wording. Yeah. سَأَلَ النَّبِيُّ جِبْرَائِيلِ يَا جِبْرَائِيلِ Do you laugh? Do you smile? قَالَ نَعَمْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Rasulullah said, when? He said, the minute the son of Adam is born. He said, over what? He said, the minute he is born until he dies. So Rasulullah was very much overtaken by the answer. He said, what is it in between birth to death that makes you laugh? He said, that man thinks he will rest. That man thinks he will have a rest in between. And there is no rest, Ya Rasulullah, in this world. The real rest is when you win your post in Jannah. That's rest. Here there is no rest. But that does not mean live miserably. Huh? Does not mean live in a bad mood day and night and make the mood of all your family bad. No. Goes into the house, he's angry. Leaves the house, angry. Goes to Baraza, angry. You give him the best juice, angry. You give him the best food, angry. I mean, what makes you happy? Huh? What is it that makes you happy? What's, your, what's wrong with you? Nothing pleases him. Nothing. He is a continuous 24-7 nagger that you don't get anything good out of him. He just nags. Day and night. Allah doesn't like these kind of people. You know? Rasulullah doesn't like. He was the most positive. See, there is no rest. But that's a positive attitude at looking for no rest. Why? Because, I'll tell you why. Average life of you and me is what? 60, 70, right? Let's calculate all the acts of worship that we do as opposed to what we do other than acts of worship. 20 years of your life is spent in sleeping. Do you know that? 20 years of your life is spent in sleeping. 30 years of your life is spent working. Okay, so how do we, what do we have now? No, we have 30 and 20, 50. Minimum studies, 18 years, right? That's what, 68. If you live to 70, you are worshipping Allah two years. Two years, two years. Out of all this, if you put salah together, if you put psalm together, yani you squeeze them, day after day, no break in between. It will amount to two years of worship. Two years of worship. And we can't sustain it. Huh? But we can sustain 20 years of, you know, work with 20, 30 years of work with 20 years of sleep, or 18 years of studies. And when it comes to two years of worship, we say, whoa, now I'm going to wake up for Fajr. It's here, Fajr here. <laughs> you don't have to stretch it, Bana. You know, it's only two minutes. It's only two minutes, but shaitan comes to you. He says, now you're going to wake up for Fajr? Look what's going to happen now. You're going to get up from your cozy bed. Then you have to walk to do wudu. It makes it sound like you're going to Mars. You know? Wallah <laughs> Then you have to open the tab. La hawla wa la Close the tab, you know. Go to the musalla. All this scenario. At the same time, the next day, someone knocks at your door. One of your friends he says, let's go fishing. Yalla! Bismillah. Let's go to Zanzibar. Bismillah. No. Zanzibar. <laughs> you know. 
Oh, how long? No, no, straight away. This is Hidayah. You chose that Hidayah. You could not cho choose the Hidayah of Fajr. You chose the Hidayah of Zanzibar. You know, to go there. This is how we can hype up ourselves psychologically. You know, we need to change that frame of work. Do not have heart number 15. Which is heart number 15? Al Qalbul Makhtoom. The one that is sealed from listening, hearing, and taking lessons from what you hear and see. It's sealed. Nothing goes in, or nothing goes out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, chapter 45, verse 23. وختم على سمعه وقلبه وجعل على بصره غشا غشاوة فمن يهديه من بعد الله أفلا تذكرون Have you seen who has taken his God his own desires You tell him there is God he says no no just enjoy life man let's go to I don't know what enjoy this haram enjoy that harmful thing or enjoy this ha he makes his own gods what his own desires and God uh, as his own and Allah has sent him astray what does that mean Allah has sent him it means Allah chose to send him astray no it's after he made his desires as God by abandoning the cause of Hidayah he has made himself astray so Allah led him yani he led him because it's by choice not by force right if you want to seek that path of this guidance or misguidance, it's your problem, not my problem. I've already shown you the way. Has sent him astray due to knowledge. Ah, yani he did not choose his desires by ignorance. No, he knew he was following falsehood. Adallahullahu an ilmin o jahlin. Ilmin. It's not by virtue of ignorance. That he was, led, he was led astray. No, it is by means of having guidance. He knows the truth. He's recognized the truth. But he doesn't want to follow the truth. Sent him astray due to knowledge. And has set, this is the point. Al-Qalb al -maktoom, And he has set a seal upon his hearing and his heart. Because of my action, my heart now is sealed. No matter how many mawaiza, no matter what you say to them, no ma you know sometimes you really need to sit by yourself and reflect and engage your heart when you feel that you have reached a place where your heart is blocked and just sit there and take one sigh. Huh? One ah. To Allah. He says, Ya Allah. Ahin, ahin. Oh, alas, alas, where I am going in this life. One sigh, one ah that connects you to Allah could change your life upside down. That's the time when you appeal to Allah and Allah will penetrate your heart with nur. And we say, You've come to me for guidance and I will reciprocate. You're asking me sincerely now to clear the way for you. I will clear it even further for you. Because you are really coming to knock on my door. And you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says? He says, the one that knocks will ultimately hear the reply. You know? The more you knock on the door of Allah, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, some people ask, why am I asking Allah day and night, 20 years, 30 years? Allah is not answering. You know, the rewire comes and clarify this. I know it requires patience, but look at the beauty of why you are not granting it, or why you are not being granted that thing. Allah steps in in the rewire. Allah steps in. He says to his angel, do you know why I'm not answering him? They say, why Allah? He says, I love his voice. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. I love to hear my servant's voice saying, Ya Allah, you know? And then when I give him, I give him in such a way that he will be astonished. He will be shocked at what I have given him. I remember one day, one Sayyid, I know him, a friend of mine, was in a group of Hajj. He went to Hajj with a sister from, you know, America. So she's going into the Kaaba, he's coming out. So he says, Assalamu alaikum, Hajj, how are you? How are you doing? Alhamdulillah. Did you ask Allah? He said, yeah, I asked Allah, you know, Allah give me risk. Said, How much? <laughs> said, roughly, exactly what you say, 100,000. 
He said, 100,000? What do you mean 100,000? Ask in trillions. What do you mean 100,000? This is Allah you are dealing with. Allahu Akbar. He just wanted to pass a message here. When you ask Allah, don't, don't be reserved. Don't be shy. What is it that you want? Of course, something useful. Huh? Not like this guy. You know, the genie came to him once. He rubbed it. And the genie came and he said, what do you want? He said, I want six-lane highway to Las Vegas. Six-lane highway to Las Vegas? What the hell do you want six-lane? He said, I want to go fulfill my desire. You know, that genie says, this guy is a fool. Let me go and ask my master. He goes to his master. He said, this guy wants six-lane highway. He said, tell him to ask something that is of use to the world. So he came back. He says, the master is saying, ask for something useful. So he scratched his head. He said, ah, good. I found it. He said, what is it? He said, what does it mean when your wife gives you the silent look? <laughs> he said, yeah, this is a question. <laughs> This is the kind of question, you know, the master, I'm not go saying God, the master. So he goes, comes back after two days, the genie. He says, the master says, do you want the six lane highway? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit difficult sometimes to understand the silent look with all respect to my sisters. Please forgive me. Just a joke. We'll say something about the men tomorrow, inshallah. So we will be balanced. So we'll be balanced. Think beyond your needs think to the need where it encompasses everyone you know when you think about money don't think about money for yourself think about money in trillions so you can reach the orphans the widows you know like amir al-mu'mineen salawatullah wa salamu alayhi what do we call what do we call amir al-mu'mineen when he had the, you know, why did Allah encouraged us to put the, the post of leadership in the hands of those who are worth it? So that justice can prevail on us. So there will, there will be the elimination of poverty, elimination of injustice, right? Because Amir al Mumini said, by God, had I been stated in my position, you would have been given risk from above your head and under your feet. He says, because he is why a just leader is what? He is in harmony with the rest of the universe. There is no conflict between him and the rest of the universe. So Allah pours his risk. But when you become an obstacle and you go outside the harmony of the rest of the world, that's when problems start to kick in. Right? What do we call Amir al-Mu'mineen? The father of orphans. Abu al-Aytam. People of Kufa, when Amir al-Mu'mineen died, they used to remark, who are for the orphans after you? Ya Ali ibn Abi Talib. Allahu Akbar. This is why we need wealth. This is why we want to be in power of wealth. So we can share it with others. And, you know, once we were discussing sometimes, what is the wisdom behind God's laws? So, so we were talking about, what's the wisdom behind zakat? What's the wisdom behind khums? People started saying, I said, I have my own opinion. I don't know if I'm right, but this is my understanding. So they said, what is it, Sheikh? I said, so that we give zakat and khums in such a way, so the zakat receiver and the khums receiver will one day become the khums giver. He does not remain a khums receiver. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Right? Or oh, there's, there's a cat receiver does not live and die receiving the cat. No. He comes a time where he becomes the one who gives what? The cat. Don't give a man a fish. No. Teach him how to fish. He will live forever. Right? You give khums, set him, set him up in a business. Right? So that he can start giving khums. Huh? Don't just give him satisfactory, you know, Amir al-Mu'mini, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, um, uh, Imam Hussein, salawatullah wa salamu alayhi. He says, a beggar came to me once, a beggar in the streets of Medina. So he says, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I haven't eaten in a few days. So he says, wait, goes, 
Imam Hussein comes out, the figure says between 5,000 to 10,000 dirham. Yeah, imagine in shillings today, in today's currency, probably 50,000. So he said, here, take. He said, Ibn Rasulullah, I want a meal. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm craving some, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, bajir. I don't want $50,000 to go and have caviar. He didn't say that, of course, I'm saying, okay. But I'm just, look what, Rasul, what Imam Hussein said to that beggar. He said, my Rasul, my grandfather said, when you give, give to sustain and maintain. Don't give just to feed. To maintain and sustain. Don't just give to feed. Huh? So that person will not beg again in the streets of your city. No, give him to set up an entrepreneurship, right? So he can give back into the community. Alhamdulillah, our leaders are looking into this entrepreneurship, you know, for the community. Someone goes, studies five, six years, he becomes a pharmacist, comes back into the community, he's on a wage of $600. Peanuts! Peanuts! No! Give him a loan to have his own pharmacy. Wallahu Akbar. Huh? Become a partner with him. Or buy, he buys you out later. Invest in another one. Invest in a doctor's surgery. Invest in a hospital. In, that's how we grow. Your forefathers were like this. Right? They gave buildings to Jama'at. You know, Dar es Salaam is the richest Jama'a on a micro scale. After, of course, we cannot match the Pakistani coaches. Uh, brother Anwar uh, Rajpar is here. He can vouch to it. Masha Allah. These Pakistani brothers, the amount of investment they've done in Pakistan, it's phenomenal. Phenomenal. But I'm talking about a smaller scale. I've been to Pakistan. I've seen the work that our Jama'at have done. It's just beyond belief how they were able to maintain and sustain. But here, 160 different buildings were donated to the Jama'as by your forefathers. 160 at least properties. Why are we holding back? Huh? What are we going to take with us? You know? Yesterday, someone, uh, our Africa Federation, you know, boss, you know, chairman, he's saying that we're having, starting a new project where we sponsor two families to set them in business. I said, I'm moving to Dar es Salaam. <laughs> I'm moving to Dar es Salaam. <laughs> if they, because we can grow, you know? We can move in this world. And you know what? It saddens me to say this, but I will say it. And you understand it. Our look sometimes towards our leadership when it comes to the pulpit is not fit enough. When we look at a Maulana, Maulana should not send his students to say his children to Harvard. No. Because you shouldn't. Maulana shouldn't be driving the latest car. Huh? Maulana shouldn't be able to afford a good watch. Huh? Only us. Let me tell you something. If the leadership, I'm not saying be extra rich. Our imams were not. But I will give you a comparison of how things change in life. Hausa, Hausa as a setup, over the course of years have changed. So much so that now the requirements of Hausa the requirements of Hausa is what? For foreign students is that they must have a minimum, minimum year 12, which is what? O level, A level, o level, what is it? A level? A level, right? Yeah, and just before going to university. But on highly recommended precaution, <laughs> okay, using the terminology of the Risala Amaliya, you know, Ihtiyat Mustahab, huh? Not wujubi, but actually wujubi. It's based on a, a compulsory precaution. The students who wants to join the Hausa as a foreign student must first have a bachelor degree at least. Why this change? Why this change in trend in the houses overseas? He said, because we don't want to put monkeys on the member. We want to put educated people here. We want people, you know why? Because they are the leaders of the community. They are the ones who are going to lead the community into progress and further. And tell me now, I challenge you. Give me one imam 
who was not the most learned of his town or of the world. And Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al-Bakr says what? He says, our followers are the elitist among their people. They must be the elitist. The elitist, the highest level in terms of everything, in terms of everything. Imam al-Sadiq was visited by a group of mystics. You know, they called them Sufis. Sufis. They said, Ibn Rasulullah, how come you're wearing brocade? You're wearing abaya that I can't even afford. Right? Don't be mistaken by looks, by the way. Sometimes coordination does not mean richness. You understand what I'm talking about, no? I can appear in public coordinated and well presented, but I don't have to ha spend an arm and a lens, you know, or a thousand or two, right? Imam al Sadiq was, uh, how come you are wearing this abaya? I can't even afford it. And look, and your grandfather, Amir al Mu'minin, had 13 patches on his dress. Look what Imam al Sadiq says. He said, that was one time, and we are living in a different time. He said, that time, there was poverty prevalent everywhere. Now we live in a time where poverty is scarce. No, 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 no. That's not a good argument. You must not appear in public. He says, no, Rasulullah says, and Rasulullah used to practice this. When people or delegation used to come to him, he used to change his clothes into the best garment he had. In fact, he had reserved one garment so that he can meet head of states with it. You know, the dignitaries. When the dignitaries used to come, he used to reserve one particular abaya or clothes so he would meet them. No, not a good argument. You must be, you know, mutakashif. You know, you must renounce the world. You must do this. You must do that. He said, no, Rasulullah says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, khuzu zinatakum inda kulli masjid. Make sure you dress up the best of dress when you come to the mosque. Of course, that is double fold. Uh, 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 dress in terms outwardly and inwardly. Yeah, and when you come to the mosque, have good akhlaq, don't slander, don't. But yet also on the outer scale, dress something nicely so that when people come, they see, mashallah, look at our community. Oh, look at their consuls, beautiful. Look at the smell that comes out of their consuls. Imam al-Sadiq says, if I spend a thousand dirham on perfume, it is not considered israf. So that we can smell nice. Not come to the mosque, and, and we want to run away. You know? No, that is not the style of Muslims. The style of Muslims that they should be at the... They could not accept the argument. He said, you know, sometimes people don't understand by... So he took his abaya. He took the second abaya. And his kameez had 14 patches. His inside kameez. They said, 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 representative of a community, right? When people look at you, they look at you through, they look at your community through you. You know? They look at your community through you. You know, one day I was traveling on uh, American airline between New York and Orlando. It happened, another rumor, Sheikh only travels business class, a lie. And I have never demanded from any community a business class ticket. Yes, I upgrade myself. That's my choice, right? Yeah. Oh, I pay homes. <laughs> okay. But to come and say Sheikh demands a business. No, I don't. One of our community leaders in New York, may Allah bless his soul, he said, Sheikh, I know someone at the desk of American Airlines or Delta, they will upgrade you. I said, Jazakallah khair, thank you. It's not like I'm traveling from here to Toronto. It's, damn it, it's from New York to Orlando, two and a half hours. Okay, so I go on the plane. That day I was wearing a Sherwani. I don't travel like this. So I was wearing a Sherwani, very nice cream Sherwani, embroidered with beautiful rainstones. And I'm going inside. I'll tell you the truth, it's, it's really nice, I have to admit. 
One of our community leaders gave it to me. It's such a nice... One day I'll come with it here, inshallah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Of course, brother. Will go. Matching watch, matching shoes. May Allah honor you. Everything is matching. The air hostess comes to me. As I'm entering, she said, come, come. Come. Wallah, I'm not boasting. I'm just relating something to you. Allah is my witness. It's Ramadan. She said, come, come. Who are you? I said, I'm a fashion designer. <laughs> no word of a lie. She said, ah, so you fashion clothes. I said, no, I fashion minds. She said, what do you mean? I said, I'm a priest. She said, you're a priest? Ah, now I get a you fashion minds. She said, what school do you belong to? I said, I'm a Muslim. You know what she said? She said, I wish all Muslims were like you. If Muslims are like this, you know, we've got the wrong impression about you guys, you know. It's not about dressing up. It's about the image. It's about, you know, how you present yourself in public. It's the first impression that lasts, right? It's the first impression that lasts in the minds of people. When they look at you, they respect you and they respect what you want to say after that. But go in the, some of the international airports, you see people, 13 stains of coffee, 10 stains of uh, sauce. He wants to represent the community. What community are you representing? Huh? What is it that you are representing? You are leaving a wrong impression in the mindset of people, right? You should not allow this to take place. Our Imams, our Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I will conclude. You know what he says? He says, do not allow the criticism against Islam to come through you. Allahu Akbar, be a cemented wall that you do not allow Islam to be criticized through an action, a mishap, a slip, a, a, a wrong idea, a, 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 a foul word that you use. No, be always mindful that Islam is a way of life. When I speak, when I dress, when I interact, when I walk, when I, it's all within the framework of what Allah and the Prophet and the Imams want, salawatullah wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. We should not have that heart that is what? Sealed, makhtoom, that nothing goes in and nothing comes out of it, you know, so that we can represent an image that is accepted by Allah first and foremost. This is for me and Allah, right? So that when we clear the passage between us and Allah, then everything will fall into harmony and into place. With this I conclude wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi tayyibin al-tahirin of your precious time, two minutes amman yujibu al-muttarra idha da'ah wa yakshuf al from the most sincerest chambers of your heart with the loudest of voices in this holy month of Ramadan don't forget these are the ayyamul beard the white days, 13, 14, 15. And now in Ramadan too, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Amman yujibu al-muttarra idha da'a wa yakshifu al-su'u. Amman yujibu al-muttarra idha da'a wa yakshifu al-su'u. أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء last time أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء بحق محمد وآل محمد وبحرمة الفاتحة مع الصلوات الله محمد